All right, hello. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, today we are hanging out with uh, Dr. Miguel Nicolelis, uh, who is a professor of neurobiology, uh, biomechanical engineering, and psychology and neuroscience at Duke University. Uh, he is also a uh, the co-director of the uh, Duke Center for uh, Neuroengineering. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you. My pleasure. And what I'd like to do is. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Dr. Uh, Nicolaelis's work, uh, it's really amazing. Uh, one researcher uh, that I'm aware of that every time I encounter a new paper uh, published by him, uh, it really almost seems more like science fiction than science. I have to keep reminding myself that this is really science. So excellent work. I think you're really pushing the, the boundaries, making us rethink uh, what is possible uh, within neuroscience. Uh, you're really kind of shaping and helping us think about the possible communications and interactions between uh, the brain, the body, as well as non-biological entities such as like robotic limbs, avatars. Uh, so just incredible work. Uh, and and I, I can't wait to talk to you today. Thank you again for, for joining us. It was a great pleasure. And also you, you probably noticed we have a few people. Uh, few friends joining. Uh, what I'd like to do is just quickly go around. If you can uh, briefly introduce yourself, uh, your name, your title, uh, maybe department and affiliation. And we'll start with uh, Dan again. Uh, hi, I'm Dan Estrada. Uh, I teach engineering ethics at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. And I've been teaching your work, Dr. Nicolaios, for a long time. And I'm happy to speak with you. A great pleasure, Daniel. All right, and uh, next up we have uh, Gideon. I'm Gideon Dayak. I'm a professor of cognitive science at University of California, San Diego, and very uh, happy to be here and excited to hear uh, more about your recent work. Thank you, Gideon. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. All right, next up, uh, John. Yeah, hi. I'm John Lawhead. I'm a postdoc uh, at the University of Southern California in philosophy and climate science. I'm a philosopher of science by training, but I work on uh, all sorts of complex systems and self-organization and that sort of thing. So I'm doing climate change right now, but I'm very interested in uh, technology and that kind of stuff. So I'm glad to be here. Hi, Joe. And next up we have Matthew. And I don't know if you're muted. Can you, Can you hear me, Chris? Cool. Uh, name, uh, department, affiliation, and so on. Name, rank, and serial number? Yeah. Yeah, okay. security number. And social, yeah, social security. Oh, whoa, no, no, no. I'm drawing the line there, definitely. <laughs> Howdy, everyone. Matt Schlesinger. I'm at uh, the psychology department at Southern Illinois University. My background's in psychology, but I kind of do a mixture of developmental psych, uh, computer modeling, and a little bit of neuroscience. Hi, met you. And a, a quick plug. Uh, Matthew just wrote a book, uh, Developmental Robotics from Baby Thanks, Chris. Robots. Make sure if you're interested in developmental psychology and robotics that you do an Amazon search and, and buy his book. Uh, uh, actually, you didn't pay me to say that either. It may be half off today at MIT Press. I'm not sure if that discount's still in effect, but I, I saw that the other day. Good to know. I think all books are half off at MIT Press. Uh, next up, Jeannie. Hi, I'm Rajni Rao, and I'm a professor of physiology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. I do biomedical research on a number of neurological disorders from uh, autism to Alzheimer's disease. Hi, Rajni. All right, and l let's begin. Um, I first in encountered uh, Dr. Nicolaios's work probably three or four years ago. I uh, listened to a brain science podcast with Dr. Ginger Campbell, and um, I'd like to, before getting into the details about brain-machine interface, brain-machine-brain -brain interface, and going into the details of, of this uh, technology, what I'd like to do is begin by getting a sense of your educational background, your training, uh, how you became interested in neuroscience. So, oh, sure. Well, I was trained in, uh, in Brazil. You know, I went to medical school. Uh, in Brazil, uh, as you probably know, you go off uh, high school directly to medical school. So I got into medical school when I was 17. And uh, I was fascinated about the brain for a variety of reasons, but primarily because I had read a book uh, by Isaac Asimov called The Brain, which was one of the, his few books that was not science fiction, but it was really fascinating to me. So I went to medical school 
you know, wanted to be a neurosurgeon. I remember this very vividly. And then I discovered that most of my friends neurosurgeons do is plumbing, you know, I, and it was kind of boring. So I decided that there must be a, a better alternative to, to be, you know, working on the brain. And by accident, uh, I started working in a lab with computers. Um, microcomputers are just getting in Brazil at that time in the uh, early 80s. And I stumbled into a, a great guy, uh, Dr. Cesar Timuria, who was the founder of Brazilian neuroscience. After spending a decade in New York in the 50s, he went back to, to Brazil to create neuroscience in Brazil. And that's when I started working with him. And it, since the beginning, we are always very fascinated uh, in, in our discussions about, you know, metaphors uh, and relationships between brains and computers. And that's where... I developed the, the interest of recording large-scale brain activity, uh, but of course I couldn't do that in Brazil, so I had, uh, as he said, the best way to do that in Brazil was to go to the airport and fly to the United States and find someone crazy enough to that wanted to do the same thing I wanted to do, and I found a crazy one, a, a great guy, John Chapin, who accepted me as a postdoc, and together we developed the method that I have been using since then uh, called chronic multi-electric recordings that has evolved, of course. You know, at that time, people were recording one cell at a time in, in animals, in a, mainly anesthetized animals, and we started building up a technology to allow us in, to record at the end of my postdoc about 40 cells in freely behaving rats, and today we are up to 2,000 neurons in freely roaming monkeys using wireless interfaces, and so that's basically a summary. Uh, great. Uh, I just have one more question before we start digging into the details and before everybody else starts asking uh, questions. Uh, so you have different lines of research. Uh, so for I'm most familiar with your, your work on brain-machine interfaces and uh, different combinations, but you also have work on like spinal stimulation and Parkinson's, uh, epilepsy. Uh, can you give us a sense of the scope of your research, the different lines of research that you have yeah, uh, at a yeah. general level? Well, you know, we have many, as you said, our research program is divided in many components because uh, since the beginning of my postdoc, or mid-postdoc, I realized that I wanted to study the brain as a dynamic, complex system. And I, I, I thought that the only way to, to start to understand this was to poke into the system from different points of view, different uh, preparations, different questions. And uh, so we started uh, studying uh, tactile processing in rats, and that was the origin of everything I did, because we were able for the first time to record multiple structures that define the somatosensory system of a, of a rodent, of a mammal, and then see the richness, the dynamical richness and, and uh, plastic capa capacity of the system. And from there on, we evolved to a line of research that originated brain-machine interfaces that was basically originated to study circuits, to study brain circuits. We had no idea that we could use this in, in neuro rehab in the, in the first years. Only a couple years later we realized that the potential was tremendous. So now we have a clinical line of research, prim primarily in Brazil, where we are working with spinal cord injury patients. But in parallel, given the theory, and actually I can show you the, the new book that I just published, the relativistic brain and how it works and why it cannot be simulated by a Turing machine, uh, uh, we, we realized that we could look at neurological disorders in a complete different way. We could think about neurological disorders as diseases of neuronal timing. And, and that's the reason I got into Parkinson's disease and epilepsy. And, and the spinal cord stimulation, uh, I'm very happy about that because uh, we made a prediction from our theory of how the brain works that if it is a dynamic system and if you have a disturbance of neuronal timing like what we observe in Parkinson, Parkinson's disease, we should be able to reverse that by changing the dynamics of the brain. And we use the spinal cord just as a highway to deliver a particular pattern of electrical stimulation from the outside that could impact the whole brain simultaneously and both in rats, monkeys and now there are 52 patients around the world that have taken advantage of that technology and it works and it seems to work uh, at, a, at a level that is pretty similar to deep brain stimulation but is much uh, uh, less invasive, uh, much easier to do 
is an outpatient procedure and is very inexpensive uh, compared to a you know a neurosurgical procedure. So I work in taste too. I work in plasticity, but all these subcomponents are related to this macro view of the brain uh, that I described a little bit in my previous book, Beyond Boundaries, and now in this monograph where we are getting you know closer to more uh, you know specific details about the theory. All right, excellent. So, uh, just the panel. If you guys have questions, feel free to just come up. Uh, if people on the panel have questions, I, I know the one question that I have. Once we start getting into the specifics that I believe uh, Dan raised about how do you you know recording from hundreds of thousands of neurons uh, in the, the hidden code was I don't remember was that Dan's question. If you can kind of elaborate on that. I just. Yeah. Oh, actually, I, I didn't know if Dan was going to elaborate, but I, I think we may have lost him. Yeah. Oh. So, sorry, I clicked the, the camera button through the microphone button. So in one of the videos that I show my class where you're describing the brain uh, uh, monkey interfaces, um, uh, you, you say something along the lines of, uh, we don't have a Rosetta Stone to crack the code, uh, that the, the code of the brain is a hidden code. Yeah. Uh, the video is almost a decade old, and my question was just how far have we come to having that Rosetta Stone to translating the code of the brain? I wonder if you could maybe fill us in about how close we are. Sure. Yeah, no, that's very interesting because that's how I started. Um, when I finished my postdoc and I came to the, the U.S. to work with John, both of us were very interested in looking for the code of tactile processing. And that's the reason we started working with rats and using the whiskers of the rats as our model to you know, see how we could decode that information when the animal touches uh, something with the whiskers, uh, uh, how is that the brain is processing that information. And the more we probed the system, the more we found how dynamic and how plastic the system is. And in, in, to some degree, I was talking about that a couple weeks ago in a lecture, uh, 10 years later, 20 years later, it's almost like uh, I believe now that we, we, we can barely talk about a code because the system is continuously adapting. And it seems that most of it is about dynamics. It's about changing according to the changing statistics of the world. So there are basic principles, of course. We, we have enumerated a few of them for the last decade. Uh, but the, the most in interesting aspect that we have found uh, in these recordings for the past uh, 10 years or so particularly in behaving monkeys, is how fluid these representations are and how much you can change um, uh, these, uh, uh, these statistics of, of these representations. Uh, to give an example, uh, we can get uh, adult rats uh, to process uh, infrared light by delivering the electrical output of an infrared sensor to the somatosensory sensory cortex, to the tactile cortex, and in a few uh, days now, rats they start tracking infrared beams using their uh, tactile cortex, which basically means that they're not seeing the light because the light is invisible to them. They don't have photoreceptors to infrared. They are touching light. They are tracking light using a tac as some sort of new tactile sensation. And this is done with the whisker area of the somatosensory cortex of the rat. So I'm much more uh, open to the idea now that what we have primarily in the brain is a dynamic self-adapting system that is continuously shaping itself according to the outside statistics, you know, and, and that makes sense since, you know, we, we all need to survive to a changing environment and, and, and new cues that we get from outside. So I'm wondering, can you, for those of those individuals not familiar with brain-machine interface, brain-machine uh, brain interface, brain-to-brain -brain interface, can you, can you give us some kind of a sense of uh, the scope and uh, how it works? So my understanding, at a very general level, you're reading hundreds of thousands of neurons going off like the primary motor cortex. Somehow you're making sense out of this information, which is controlling something. Uh, yeah. a, a robot, a robotic arm, or an avatar. 
Uh, and then you have information coming back into the somatosensory system, creating this loop. Can you, uh, there are so many questions here. I mean, how, how did you sure. figure this out? How could you record from thousands of neurons? How do you find the signal and the noise? Yeah, well, yeah, we could spend a long time going into the technical details, but basically we use uh, arrays of uh, flexible hair-like uh, multi uh, microelectrodes, basically. And this can be chronically implanted uh, in different locations of the brain, superficial and deep. In fact, we are probably the only lab at this point that uh, does both multiple cortical areas and multiple subcortical areas in the same uh, recording session in the same animal. And what you get is uh, uh, these action potentials produced by these uh, hundreds of cells. And we probably got lucky without knowing when we started using the motor system because some aspects of prediction of uh, movements are linear. So we can combine the spike streams of these neurons in a linear way or you know, in very uh, uh, simple nonlinear or quadratic equations, for instance, and predict uh, kinematic or dynamic parameters that are important for you to move your hand or walk or so in that sense it was lucky that we could get but we soon realized that this would only work and in, 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 in the brain machine interface has two components basically in a very simplified way one is to extract signals from the brain to generate motor outputs the second is exactly what you mentioned the feedback to the subject and for a long time, people used, uh, uh, we introduced this with visual feedback. So the, the rat or the monkey looks at the device, either the real device or a computer image of the device. And the visual feedback is used to guide you know, the, uh, the animal because it provides feedback to the perf about the performance of that uh, actuator, that artificial actuator that is under the animal's own brain control. But uh, soon after that, we realized that tactile feedback is very important. And we developed two ways to do that. Uh, we, we went to the most complicated one first, that is to deliver tactile feedback directly into the tactile cortex using microstimulation. So we showed the monkeys could not only imagine movements and use their brain activity to control a robotic device or an avatar of themselves, but they could interpret artificial tactile feedback coming from the hand of one of these avatars directly to the, the somosensory cortex, bypassing the skin, the brain would make sense of that. It would create a new representation in a few days, and we don't know what the monkey felt, but uh, the monkey could uh, handle this, and we call this a brain-machine brain interface. More recently, in humans, we went back to the skin, which is a great transducer, and in paralyzed patients, in paraplegic patients, uh, we got feedback generated by sensors in the foot of a robotic vest, an exoskeleton. So these sensors were in the plantar surface of the feet of the exoskeleton. So when the exo touched the ground, a pressure wave is delivered to the skin or the forearm of the patients because the patient is wearing a, a haptic display. It's a shirt. We call it a haptic shirt. And there are some vibromechanical elements that are applied to the skin or the forearm. So when the exo is walking, the patient is feeling this pressure on the forearm skin, but if you get the right combination of speed and intensity, uh, you create a phantom sensation. You fool the brain to feel that is the patient's own legs that are moving. So all our paraplegic patients have phantom legs and phantom feet, and they describe to us the sensation that they are not in a machine. They are walking by themselves, and they can feel even the temperature of the ground if you trick a little bit the, this delivery of this tactile feedback. So these are variations of the team. These are variations of the same brain machine interface team. Uh, more recently, and I'll, I'll finish here, we have introduced two new concepts and we have a couple papers coming very soon about them. One is a brain-to-brain -brain interface where we got first uh, rats to exchange uh, messages from one animal to another. And now we have something called a brain net where we have monkeys that combine their brains, three, two or three monkeys combine their brain activity to achieve a common goal, like moving an avatar arm in space. And we show that the animals adapt socially to this partition of the task. So there are very quick plastic adaptations 
that make these animals interact with one another even if they don't know who is behind the, the computer screen. They don't really know that there are other monkeys, but they know that there's something helping them achieve that task. And we are showing this new paper that is coming in a few weeks, how the monkeys' brains adapt to basically forget the mission that another monkey is doing and just concentrate on, on, the, uh, on the component that they are in charge of, each monkey. Uh, so this is a summary of these different applications. Does uh, anyone have any questions? Oh, we did have a question come in. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and I'm assuming it's referring to the interaction or the interface. If you have a weather analogy. Does this mean uh, that the price, precise location for I just, the yeah. precise location for the interfacing is not important? The interface just has to be in the ballpark. Yeah. Is that, yeah. That's one of the big first discoveries of the field was that you know when I was growing up in graduate school. People used to say that there were these very tight and spatially well-defined representations of the body in the motor cortex and in the somosensory uh, cortex, and these were called topographic maps. Yeah, there is there is some topography there, of course, but when we drop our electrodes for the first experiment in rats and in monkeys, we really didn't pay much attention to these details because it was very difficult. We knew that we are in the general vicinity of the shoulder and the arm representation. But it turned out that it didn't make uh, much of a difference. If you're in the primary motor cortex, you could get, uh, in a pseudo-random sample, enough neurons related to the task. And the more the monkey trained in that task, the more the cells become related to the task. So that was a big first surprise. And then we start putting electrodes in different structures, all the way to the posterior parietal cortex. And we still got enough information out of these neurons uh, even though they were in what people call association areas, uh, we still got information about movement that we could use to, not as well as the primary motor cortex, but it's still uh, it's highly significant. So we saw that these messages were extremely distributed across the frontal parietal lobes. And uh, the issue of topographic maps, again, became much more fluid for us. We we would People would tell when I started that this idea would never work because I would have to fish with each electrode to get the precise cell to control the, the biceps or the triceps or the extensor of the wrist. And I said, well, I don't think so, given what I saw in the rat. And we went almost blindly into the motor cortex. And long and behold, every time you go there, uh, if what matters is the number of neurons that you record. In fact, for every experiment we have done in mice, rats, monkeys, and humans now, is the logarithm of the number of neurons recorded simultaneously that linearly predicts how well you can predict, let's say, the direction of movement or the force that you, the animal applies with the hand. So the log of the number of recorded neurons is, the, is, is really what matters. So it's the mass of neurons that you're recording from. In, in the location, so some of your work, like the Walk Again project, uh, this is we're using EEG recordings, correct? So, which typically aren't known for their ability to localize. So, yeah. in hindsight, the, the fact that you're able to use EEG and somebody can think about moving in an exoskeleton does the movement, uh, I think, also shows that location is probably not. Oh, key. absolutely. Yeah, this is a very good point. And uh, when we started working with these eight patients um, uh, two years ago, a year and a half ago. Um, we knew that we, we, we couldn't do intracranial recordings. The technology was not ready. I think it's getting ready now. You know, I, I think there, you know, a lot of things were done with, you know, with humans, patients there. I don't think it was time for it. We're just getting now uh, with wireless technology, with miniaturization, these chips. And so we decided to give a shot with EEG. And, and, and as you say, uh, EEG has the great advantage of being non-invasive and easy to do. Uh, of course, you need to know what you're doing because there are many mechanical artifacts and cardiovascular respiratory artifacts that you need to take care of, particularly in an open environment like we did in a, in a soccer field. That was pretty crazy. Uh, but we learned ways to handle that. On the other hand, as you said, uh, you don't localize very well the sources. You know, uh, uh, and what we notice is that our patients got better and better of imagining the movement because when we started with them, since they were paraplegic for many years, some of them for more than a decade, the, the representation of lower limbs seemed to have vanished 
from their brains. You know, when we asked them to imagine moving their hands without moving their hands, we could see the EEG modulating very easily. And that's when we start training them. But when we ask them to imagine their legs moving, nothing happened in the EEG for weeks until they start handling or, or get trained with the avatar. That's the reason we create an avatar in a closed loop control with their brains. So they could actually, we could actually re-embed a representation of lower limbs in their somosensory motor cortices. And only a few weeks later, we start seeing the EEG of these patients modulating when they imagine, uh, you know, moving their lower limbs. And it, but then we continue the training, and today our patients can use both hemispheres independently. They can control individual leg movements uh, using each side of the brain independently. So they're very proficient right now, and yet we cannot localize this very well. We, you know, it's sensory motor cortex, but we clearly saw uh, plastic changes taking place because in the beginning there was nothing there on the EG and now we can clearly show uh, the, uh, you know uh, the modulations so that is a, as Chris you're saying is another uh, uh, piece of evidence suggesting that the the classical localization view of the brain is slowly getting out is slowly dying you know is almost I I use I call this in my book a uh, the phrenology of the 20th century, because for a long for a long time we wanted to allocate functions to every little uh, corner of the cortex, and it doesn't seem to work like that. It seems to work much more as a dynamic and distributed system. Does anyone have any other questions? I, I know. Uh, I think John had an ethics question about some of this research. I, I actually wanted to ask a little bit more about that the new book, uh, if you don't mind. Um, no, that's fine. I, it seems like, um, from what you're saying, that the fact that we know that the brain is some kind of self-organized dynamical system now that doesn't have all of these little localized uh, things going on, that implies that it can't be accurately simulated uh, ever on a digital computer. And that seems like an interesting sort of leap to me. I haven't read the book yet. I just oh, found no, no. out of the yeah, no, I, If you could say a little bit more oh, about the course. argument. No, no, that looks. Is, but the argument is not that. The argument is much richer than that. Uh, what we did, I, I work with, uh, for 10 years now, I have collaborated with uh, a great mathematician, Swiss mathematician, uh, Ronald Sikorel. Uh, and uh, we have discussed for many years a, a variety of questions that we summarize in this monograph. And what we have here is a series of mathematical, computational, neurobiological, and evolutionary arguments uh, contradicting or falsifying the, uh, the idea that a digital computer can reproduce the entire richness of human uh, brain uh, uh, behaviors and human brain uh, functions. And, but the argument is not because of localization or distributed processing. In fact, we, as I said, I think the two things uh, coexist. There is a degree of topography and specialization on top of this global distributed uh, processing. The argument is, is very different. It starts from the notion that uh, the brain the brain functions and the high order functions that we, we call human functions uh, are uh, not reducible to an algorithm. They are non-computable in that sense. They cannot be put in a sequence of instructions and represented in a classical uh, algorithm that a Turing machine can process. Uh, we suggest by a variety of uh, things that you know, we can discuss uh, either later or you know, if, it's a very short book but it's a very interesting uh, conversation because of course is a mathematician talking to a neuroscientist and we both had to learn our different uh, languages and our different dialects but basically we we argued that the brain is an example of a non-computable system that cannot be reduced to an algorithm and and because it was never built it doesn't come from a blueprint it doesn't come from a piece of engineering but he, he evolved to a series of random steps then maximize or optimize its structure uh, to compute as a structure, to compute as an analog structure. So we provide a, a metaphor uh, to the closest metaphor we can come is a hybrid digital analog recursive system in which the action potentials are the digital component that we can simulate like we did for brain machine interfaces uh, as long as they're re uh, linear and 
uh, reducible to an uh, algorithm. But once these action potentials circulate through the white matter of the brain, they generate electromagnetic fields. This is the analog component. And that's where we escape. That's where we escape the realm of digital machines. And, and the interesting point is that this is a recursive model because the analog signals that we are uh, describing, they can affect the neuronal firing by induction. And they can basically account for how we get this binding of the whole cortex into a, what we are calling in our book a space-time continuum, a neuronal space-time continuum. So the argument is very much uh, uh, involving, you know, mathematical computation of neurobiological uh, 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 discussions, but it's not related to the topographic versus distributed. The consequence of forming this space-time continuum generates this distributed representation. It's a consequence of the uh, origins of, of this computation engine that for us is, uh, is non-computable by a Turing machine. So uh, Jake has a question. Uh, seems like there's a use in the avatar feedback system simply uh, for uh, physical rehab. Has anyone really tried to use like the avatar for uh, physical rehab? No, no, we are using for physical rehab in our patients and that proved to be a key component of the brain machine interface program for humans. Uh, so the I have, avatar is? I, I think we're oh, talking yeah, well, about that. Yeah, no, the avatar is. Uh, well, our patient's training starts by them learning to use the EEG to control a soccer player walking in a, in a virtual field. So it's an avatar of a soccer player that needs to walk and then kick a ball. So that's when they learn to they, are, they learn to use their EEG to generate simple movements like standing up, walking, stopping, and kicking. Once they are there in a few weeks, and we are providing both visual feedback, so they see with this Oculus Rift the, the player you know, walking, but they also receive this tactile feedback as every time the foot of the avatar touches the grass or every time the knee flexes, let's say. And we got to a point where we can induce sensations in these patients of either stepping on grass, stepping on hot asphalt, stepping on sand. We can manipulate this tactile feed, visual tactile feedback to a point where they really, we found parameters for each one of the patients that can actually give them very rich and different tactile sensations about the surface in which, on which they're walking. Okay? Once they, they, they pro become proficient in this, we move them to a, a commercially available uh, 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 robotic walker that walks in the air in the same position so they get used to being encased on a robotic device. They're not walking autonomously, they're walking on a treadmill on the air and then a little bit on the treadmill, but they get used to using brain activity to control a big machine and feeling the feedback from the machine because we put now these sensors on the on the joints of this uh, robotic walker and, and the patients get upgraded from the avatar to this robotic walker. Once they graduate from that one, then they go to the exoskeleton and then they can start learning walking in a room by themselves and, and is a, is, is a, you know, by the time they get to the exoskeleton it's really quick. The previous steps uh, we have learned are the key uh, training steps because once they get into the uh, exo, they are already used to the brain machine interface, they are already used to the sensations, but what we didn't expect was that once they get into the exo and start walking on the ground, that the phantom gets really realistic and is proportional to the speed of the exo. If the exo crosses a certain threshold of speed, the patient goes from saying, okay, I'm being carried by a machine to I'm walking by myself. And I'm suspicion, my suspicion is that the vestibular system is engaged up above a certain velocity that in, in, enriches this illusion, this phantom illusion. And we are studying that right now to, to see if that hypothesis is correct. All right, so we need, we need to start winding down. Gideon? Yeah, can I ask a quick question? I, let me apologize in advance. I'm going to have to sign off uh, pretty quickly to get to another meeting, and I'm sorry because this is extremely interesting. Um, you know, my, my question ha has to do with 
this research that you've done uh, with you know uh, large kind of assemblies of, of neurons measuring single cells from hundreds of cell uh, cells in in the monkeys, and you know it seems to me that this is a great opportunity to address questions about um, about encoding, uh, addressing some of these topics you've been talking about. You know, the, there's so much evidence for the redundancy of uh, encoding across cortex. Um, have you been able to look at like stability statistics for coactivation of of some of these units when you've got you know a, a lot you're recording for a lot from a lot of units? How much stability is there in in the system? Um, can you identify some of the sources of redundancy? Yeah, well, uh, there are many definitions of stability. I mean, first, uh, sure. I can tell you that the recording stability is very uh, good with these uh, microfilaments. So you can keep these units for weeks, and we can keep recordings alive for years. We have monkeys now here at Duke that lasted, uh, in terms of recordings, uh, six years. So that's uh, wow. the technique stability is the first important answer. Then we, are, we can track cells for several days, the same cells, and with the monkeys doing uh, different tasks or different things in a different day. So we have looked at that. And uh, contrary to what I learned in graduate school, uh, it's very dynamic. It's very plastic. You know, if you change minute details on the contingence of the task, like the reward amount or the kind of movement the monkey has to do with the hand, and you see these uh, things changing. Uh, to give an idea, one of my grad students, a biomedical engineer now, is showing that the, the motor tuning in the primary motor cortex, directional tuning of these neurons, are changing continuously in the uh, anticipatory period. Uh, when the animal is actually making a decision to move, you can see already a lot of, of jitter in these curves. Uh, which in the beginning we thought they were very stable, like you know, like receptive fields were felt or were believed to be very stable, and we are finding that tactile receptive fields, visual receptive fields, are really very dynamic. You know, with, with no manipulation whatsoever, just by in, inherently dynamic. Mm -hmm. But we have we have over the, the the years published a lot of papers dealing exactly with this aspect. You know, uh, how the predictions coming from the ensembles remain stable. And the question is, when you get a, a, above a certain number of neurons, the ensemble outcome is stable. The neurons may jitter, but the ensemble gets rid of the correlated noise, and the ensemble remains stable. So we can get a monkey doing this for the whole day, you know, let's say. But what is beautiful is that the combination of neurons that underline each trial of the arm movement is not necessarily the same. In fact, it's never the same. So it's almost this, the system can cut this multidimensional space in many different ways to get the same behavioral outcome. That's, that's my view at this point. Fascinating. Thank Great. You. I'll sign off, but thank you for that. Thank you, Julian. Pl pleasure. You. Pleasure meeting you. So we are already over time. Maybe have time for one more question, though. All right. I just had a question, and if I may. Uh, I was curious if uh, you use optogenetics in your research, if you see much potential for that. Well, I, I, you know, I find that optogenetics is very beautiful, very interesting, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm not very fond of it myself, you know, because uh, I, I'm just afraid that we are going now from, from the macrophrenology to cell phrenology. You know, we, mm -hmm. want to we desperately want to assign functions to a cell type, particularly in the cortex, mm -hmm. I think that is not going to happen. In the brain stem, hypothalamus, Yes, that, that may happen. Uh, but for the kind of research that we do, intracortical microstimulation, electrical microstimulation does everything we need. So mm -hmm. we really don't need to be specific uh, at that level. And every time we try to be specific, actually we found out that we, the moment you remove a cell type from the system, a component from the system, the system adapts to that removal and it changes. The, 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 the contributions of the remaining cell types change immediately or very quickly. So uh, it's very difficult to assign. Uh, and this was true also in the past with lesions, right? When we did the uh, lesions of the brain and we, we had the simplified ver view that if we lesion something and we see a difference in behavior is because uh, the lack of that particular piece of tissue is causally linked to the, the, the decrease in the in the behavior performance or whatever, 
uh, and it turned out to be a much more complicated uh, issue. Mm -hmm. So it's a long, a long answer to say that yes, it's a very useful technique and it's very interesting, but uh, I don't think is uh, people are making a panacea of something that I'm not sure is as as relevant as as you know we think. Mm -hmm. So what's next? What is next? Yeah, well, in, in this area of neuroengineering, what are the next big questions or hurdles that need to be overcome? Oh, the, there are many big questions. I think there are uh, new brain-machine interfaces for rehabilitation, for sure. That's a one big area. I think we are going to see more clinical applications, a lot of more clinical applications. But from more fundamental basic science, I'm very interested in understanding how brains interact socially you know, multiple brains. And with the brain net preparation, now we have a chance to put as many monkeys as we want, or as many uh, rats, or using EEG, as many human beings we want, uh, interacting mentally and see how that changes, uh, you know, uh, whether you can create a global computing structure uh, of some sort. Uh, so I'm, we are doing a lot of experiments in that direction. All right, so we're already over, uh, but I just wanted to thank you, thank you again. Very, very fascinating research, and I can't wait to see what comes out next. Thank you very much, Chris. It was a great pleasure. Thank you all. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Very, very interesting. Nice. Bye, bye then. <laughs>